the seminar. So I welcome everyone to the Life Sciences Department uh, seminar. This is also organized with, by the Bioinformatics uh, for Women uh, special seminars. And I'm, it's really an honor for me to introduce to you Tandy Warno, the speaker, the speaker of today. Uh, she's really an, an excellent scientist and someone uh, with, a, with a very good trajectory in, in really important problems that relate not only to, to evolutionary biology, but also in other topics. She's associate head of the Department of Computer Sciences at the Illinois University. And well, she has several other affiliated positions such as the National Center for Supercomputing Applications or the Carwos Institute for, for Genomic Biology. And she has uh, dedicated uh, a lot of efforts uh, in her life to, to solve very complex uh, problems of evolutionary biology. And I hope uh, we will hear about that. Uh, just as an example, she was, uh, her methods and, and her team was instrumental in a recent, well, in a couple of years ago in an article published in Nature where they reconstructed the evolution of over a thousand plant uh, transcriptomes. And by doing so, they, they reconstructed the evolution of one billion years of, of green plants. But she's not only working with a tree of, uh, of genomic information, she has applied her methods also to many other problems such as the evolution of, of languages. And I don't want to, to take more, more time from her. I thank her a lot uh, to be willing to give this presentation to us. And I think it will be very interesting. And whenever you want, Andy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to give this talk. I wish that I were actually with you. Um, Barcelona is a wonderful city. Okay, I'm gonna be talking about uh, entering the genomic era of the tree of life. And what I'm talking about here is how do we estimate how life evolved using genome scale data. So that's phylogenomics, phylogeny plus genomics. Um, and the tree of life is a very large tree. And one could even argue it's not even a tree because there's horizontal gene transfer. But the estimation of this evolutionary history is the problem that I wanna talk about today. I'm going to be talking about certain steps in a phylogenomic pipeline, which begins with deciding what question you're trying to answer and collecting your data and annotating your genomes, figuring out perhaps what the orthologs are, estimating multiple sequence alignments for every gene, which is to say every locus, getting gene trees, constructing the species tree, or if you think there's horizontal gene transfer or hybridization, constructing a phylogenetic network. Then from that analysis, you then try to get statistical support, you try to get dates, and then with all that information, you now try to understand biology. So what's clear is that the things that you're doing here can impact the final biological discoveries. And if you do the initial steps, which are bioinformatics steps, then the subsequent conclusions can be wrong. And this is something that is very important to think about because many of the uh, large phylogenomic projects, this is one we were just hearing about, the 1KP, the 1,000 plant, tran plant transcriptome project. There were two different studies um, that we did, one in 2014, one in 2019. And these data sets had very large numbers of sequences for each locus and many loci. And we had enormous amounts of heterogeneity in the data set. The heterogeneity was different sorts of heterogeneity, including some genes that evolved with duplications and losses so that they were multi-copy inside the genomes. And we had some cases where the gene trees, even when restricted to just the single copy genes, were all different from each other. So heterogeneity and large data sets are a natural outcome of any kind of large phylogenomic project. This is not the only case that this occurs. It also occurred in the avian phylogenomics project, also in 2014. And there we didn't have quite as many species, but we had more genes, 14,000 in fact. And this large amount of data created all sorts of challenges beyond the ones that we had with the plant transcriptome. So, when we look at this phylogenomic pipeline, there are many steps here. I only work on some of them, 
Um, what I work on is once the genes are selected, so you've annotated your genomes, you've decided which loci you're going to study, which gene families you're going to study. I work on the problem of getting multiple sequence alignments for each gene. I work on the problem of constructing maximum likelihood gene trees. I work on the problem of combining gene trees into a species tree. So these are the problems that I work on, and I'm going to be talking about some of this today, but not all of it. There, the other steps are also very important, but those are not my expertise. So before I start um, moving into the things I actually do, I want to actually encourage people to ask questions during the talk. Um, if the questions are to clarify something I'm saying, because it's very likely that I'll use some term or say something that you won't, you know, you won't be familiar with the terms. So clarifying will be better to do early rather than later. So please consider that encouraging. Just go ahead and ask a question if you have any. There will also, I hope, be time at the end. Okay, so phylogeny estimation is really a combination of computer science and statistics. And the reason I say statistics is that essentially the, the way that people try to estimate phylogenies is that you have a statistical model of evolution and you use that assumption about that model to inform the estimated tree. So you're trying to basically fit your data to a model where you know something about the model. That's the statistics part. The computer science part is that these problems are almost always NP hard or just computationally intensive and you're using MCMC. You need to think about runtime. You need to think about memory usage. Um, so the combination of computer science and statistics is a very interesting one. And it's also for me, um, very beautiful. So I'm going to talk about some of the problems here. You will notice that I said that it also affects multiple sequence alignment, and that's true, but I'm not going to be talking about the multiple sequence alignment problem here. Okay. So large data sets, large data sets can be large in two different ways. So the first kind of large is the number of species. If you have, let's say, 100 species, that's not that large. It may be large when other things are large as well, but 100 species is not that large. Current phylogenomic pipelines are actually starting to look at 1,000 or even more species. And if you're only looking at a single gene, you might be looking at hundreds of thousands of sequences for that single gene. So the number of species or individuals is one dimension. The other dimension is the number of genes or the number of loci. So when you use a single gene, that number is one. When you use genome scale data, as we saw, you could get up to tens thousands. So two different kinds of large, and they impact the computational and the statistical problems differently. There's also the issue of missing data. You might have uh, genes that are not present in certain species. You might have uh, genes that are present, but you didn't sample them. Um, heterogeneity of all sorts occurs. And then many of the most accurate approaches are based upon likelihood, either maximum likelihood or Bayesian MCMC. And when you're based upon maximum likelihood, you have NP hard optimization. When you're trying to do a Bayesian MCMC, you have to wait for it to converge. These are just very computationally intensive approaches. So large data sets are difficult for computational reasons. They're also difficult because of the heterogeneity, which requires much more complex modeling. So one of the kinds of heterogeneity that I'm going to be talking about today is how across the genome you get different trees. What do I mean by different trees? I mean the actual locus, the actual gene evolves on a tree that is not topologically the same as the species tree. So if you look at this example, this is about human, chimp, gorilla, and orangutan. Human and chimp are more closely related than they are to gorilla or orangutan. And the human, chimp, and gorilla are more closely related to each other than they are to orangutan. So the species tree is this one. It's the one on the right. Gene 1000 has a tree topology that matches the species tree, but gene one doesn't. Human and gorilla are not siblings in the species tree, but they are in that gene. So what's going on here is that there's real heterogeneity across the genome. 
And when you try to estimate a species tree, you have to take that into consideration to be able to get an accurate tree. There are multiple causes for discord between gene trees and the species tree. One of them is this thing called incomplete lineage sorting, otherwise known as ILS. Incomplete lineage sorting is going to be one of the topics that I have today, and it's something that has to do with population level processes. The second one is gene duplication and loss, where a gene duplicates in the evolutionary history so that it can appear more than once inside a given genome. Gene duplication and loss is a different problem than incomplete lineage sorting, and some groups have a lot of gene duplication and loss, some groups have less. All groups have incomplete lineage sorting. So one question is, you know, which one is more important to address? They're actually both important to address. Horizontal gene transfer, otherwise known as HGT or lateral gene transfer, is something that occurs in bacteria um, and many other organisms as well. Uh, and it's its own challenge and when you have a lot of HGT, such as when you're dealing with bacteria, it can become very, very difficult to estimate the tree. Today, I'm gonna to really be focusing on the first two, incomplete lineage sorting and gene duplication and loss. But I'll be happy to talk about HGT if you have questions later. So today's talk, uh, I have three parts. I'm not 100% sure that I'll get through all three, but the first two are about species trees. Estimating species trees, either under incomplete lineage sorting or under gene duplication and loss or under their combination when both are occurring. And the third part is about how to get maximum likelihood trees on very large data sets. So very, very large data sets here, I mean, well more than 10,000 sequences. So solving maximum likelihood well and improving on RaxML, which right now is the leading maximum likelihood software in the world. So I'm going to be presenting theoretical perspective and empirical perspectives. I don't think you can understand estimation using only one of them. You need to have an understanding of the theory and of the empirical results to be able to interpret your data. So I'm gonna be doing both. So if you're a theoretician, you'll get some theory. If you're an empiricist, you'll get some empirical work and hopefully it'll satisfy everyone a little bit. And like I said, please go ahead and do interrupt with questions. So part one, species tree estimation addressing incomplete lineage sorting. So I'm showing human, chimp, gorilla, and orangutan. And human, chimp, gorilla, and orangutan is a canonical example of how difficult it is to get a species tree, even though there's only four species. So what do we have with this? problem is we are taking sequences that we see at the leaves, right? For example, sequence alignments at the leaves, and we're trying to reconstruct the tree. What I want you to notice here is that the estimated tree is unrooted. Why is it unrooted? It's unrooted because the statistical models of evolution are time reversible. So when we are applying phylogeny estimation methods, we get unrooted trees back. So if you want to get a rooted species tree, typically what you will do is include in your data set some species that is clearly an outgroup. That what that means is it's more distantly related to the remaining species. For example, if you wanted to get a phylogeny on birds, you could include a lizard. That lizard would be an outgroup. Okay, so you to root a tree, you include an outgroup. But the estimation methods themselves produce unrooted trees. Um, when we look at accuracy in tree estimation, we're going to be looking at accuracy with respect to the unrooted tree only. So I wanted to remind you we're talking about human, chimp, gorilla, and orangutan. There's only four species here. So there's only three unrooted trees to think about. And they are all just human, chimp versus gorilla, orangutan human gorilla versus chimp orangutan, and human orangutan versus gorilla and chimp. And again, we're estimating unrooted trees. So how do we do this? Mathematically, we formulate statistical models of sequence evolution. The assumption is that you have a sequence at the root of a tree, 
and the positions in the sequence are evolving down the tree under a stochastic process, and the positions evolve identically and independently of each other. That's the IID assumption. So to model this, every edge has a probability of change. And if you change on the edge, you'll change according to some four by four substitution matrix. For the Jukes Kanner model, you just assume that all substitutions are equally probable. This is a very simplistic model, Jukes Kanner. You can make it more complex by allowing more complicated four by four substitution matrices. You can do protein evolution by having 20 by 20 substitution matrices. So this is the standard way that people do statistical estimation of phylogenies is they assume a model of evolution. So the basic question from the statistics side is, is your method for estimating the tree statistically consistent under that model? What that means is, as the data goes to infinity, your error goes to zero. In the context of estimating phylogenies, the sequence length should go to infinity, and you should be able to prove that your tree estimation will converge to the correct tree with probability going to one. That's another way of saying it is once the sequences are long enough, you will get the true tree with whatever probability you want. You want probability 90%, a certain length will suffice. 95%, a longer length will suffice. You need a proof. This is not something you can demonstrate with a simulation. But anyway, that's the concept, statistical consistency for a method under a model. And under the Jukes Kenner model, there are many methods that are statistically consistent, including distance-based methods like neighbor joining, including maximum likelihood. So statistical consistency is feasible even under complex models like the generalized time reversible model. I just want you to remember statistical consistency is an important concept. And it actually very much influences the choice of method among biologists. So it's well understood that individual genes don't have enough information in them to give you a good tree on a large data set. So what happens is that on a single gene, you don't get a very good tree. You can tell it's not very good because you can do statistical support like branch, uh, branch support from bootstrapping and you say, okay, I don't have a lot of confidence in this tree. I don't have a lot of confidence in this edge. I don't have a lot of confidence in that edge. But maybe genome scale data would be enough. That was the hope. But now you will remember that we talked about heterogeneity across the genome. And that has meant that maximum likelihood estimation under these simple models isn't appropriate because different parts of the genome evolve under different trees. So maximum likelihood is assuming everything is evolving under one tree and they're not. So how do we do species tree estimation when we have, for example, incomplete lineage sorting or gene duplication and loss? So what we do is we actually model incomplete lineage sorting mathematically. And this is not recent work. There is this coalescent process. It's been modeled for a long time, the multi-species coalescent model. And this is a drawing from another person's paper. Um, and what I'm showing you here, James Degnan's paper, is each dot is an individual, okay? And the rows are generations. And what you have is each individual is picking its parent for that allele, an individual with a single allele, it picks its parent from the previous generation at random. And then that individual picks its parent from the previous generation at random. And so it's a coalescent process. And you can see this process, this is Darwin right here, going backwards in time, and now this process, and they found a common ancestor right here. This is called a coalescence. Now these two lineages here and here, they come up and they fail to coalesce. What happens up here is you have three lineages. And when, as soon as you have three lineages, any pair of them can coalesce first. And so unfortunately, so to speak, what happens is that the two that coalesce first are gorilla and orangutan, and you get a rooted tree that is different from the species tree. So this gene tree topology as a rooted tree is different from the species tree. Now, what are these, the param parameters of the model are sort of the 
the branch lengths in coalescent units. So the more time that elapses, the more likely it is that they will coalesce. The shorter the time, the less likely. So if you have something called a rapid speciation, rapid radiation, you're gonna have a lot of what's called deep coalescence and you'll have a lot of gene trees that are different from the species tree. So deep coalescence comes from very fast speciation and short branches, short amount of time between speciation events and it leads to this heterogeneity, okay? But the thing is this mathematical model means that every possible gene tree could occur and has a non-zero probability. Every species tree with its parameters defines a distribution on the gene tree topologies. Okay, so deep coalescence is called incomplete lineage sorting and it makes it possible for gene trees to be different from the species tree. So here's the unfortunate thing. We have a species tree and it generates gene trees. And the gene trees don't have to be the same as the species tree. And some of them can even be missing some of the species. And then you evolve sequences down the gene trees and you get sequences at the leaves. And the estimation problem is to take the sequences at the leaves and try to estimate the species tree. So that's the challenge. The traditional approach is concatenation. Concatenation means you take all of the sequences for the different genes, you take the alignments and you put them into one big matrix. And then you just run maximum likelihood or neighbor joining or whatever. But when you do that concatenation analysis, you're assuming that everything is evolving down a single tree. It's clearly not true. And there is now a proof that doing this can actually lead to the wrong tree and that this is depends upon the model but can lead to the wrong tree with confidence going to one so that as you take more and more genes your confidence goes to 100 percent and if your confidence goes to 100 percent and you get a tree you're going to say okay that's the tree but there's a proof now that that can be the wrong tree so Concatenation is not a statistically consistent method for species tree estimation under the multi-species coalescent. When you have incomplete linear sorting, concatenation can make mistakes. In practice, it's, it's more complicated and I'll show some results, but in practice, you can imagine measuring the error on the y-axis and for every sequence length, you can look at how the error, you can calculate error. So imagine you're doing a simulation and from very short sequences, so just like one gene, you can have high error. As you have more and more genes, error will decrease, but it may not go to zero. And that would be an example of something that can happen. So how are we going to estimate the species tree given this hierarchical model? So there's a natural approach, which is you take the sequences at the leaves for each gene and you estimate the gene tree. You can go from the sequences for each gene to an estimated gene tree for each gene. And now you can take those estimated gene trees and fit them to a species tree model. Find the best species tree that fits that distribution. So estimate the gene trees. Once you have the gene trees, estimate the species tree. Two steps, okay? This is called a summary method. The reason it's called a summary method is that to get the species tree, you are combining gene trees. You're, you're summarizing the information in your gene trees. From an empirical perspective, it's very fast. It can be parallelized. And the result is that you can get species trees in much less time using summary methods than you can using concatenation. To put that into context, in the Avian project, our concatenation analysis took 250 CPU years. And that was for just 48 species, 250 CPU years. Summary methods are much, much, much faster. Okay, so what is the theory? So if you're not interested in theory, give me one minute and then we'll switch over to empirical again. But there's this beautiful theorem by Elizabeth Allman, James Degnan, and John Rhodes from 2011 that says if you only have four species, only four, and you're just trying to get the unrooted species tree, 
you can just look at all the gene trees and whichever topology appears the most often, that will be the right choice. So for example, with four species, there's only three different possible unrooted trees. Just take whichever one appears the most often. That will be correct. Correct meaning with probability going to one as the number of genes goes to infinity, you will get the right tree, the right species tree. Unfortunately, this isn't true for five species. So you can't just take the most frequently observed five leaf unrooted gene tree. With five species, you have to do something else. With 100 species, you have to do something else. So what should you do when you have more species? So for the computer scientists in the audience, I think you can imagine what you might do. You would compute this gene tree, you look at all the gene trees, for every four species, look at the most commonly observed gene tree topology and write it down. Now you have a bunch of quartet trees and choose four quartet trees. If they're all correct, you can construct the species tree in many different ways. One way is to figure out a sibling pair. Once you figure out a sibling pair, remove one of the two, recurse, and then add that species back in. So what that means is that if you have all of the quartet trees correct, you can do this. Now, the problem is you won't get the quartet trees exactly correct. So here's another approach. You take all of the gene trees you have, you encode them as quartet trees. And now instead of assuming that they're all correct, that the most frequently observed quartet tree is correct, you simply look for a species tree that maximizes the number of quartet trees that it agrees with, with the input gene trees. This is an NP-hard optimization problem. So it's not gonna be feasible to solve this problem exactly in polynomial time, but there's a theorem that says, if you solve it exactly, you have a statistically consistent method for getting the species tree. Now, that's nice, but we're not gonna be able to solve it exactly. So what we do is we solve a constrained version of the problem. And what that means is you're not, you're not searching all tree space. You're gonna constrain yourself to only searching tree space where the species trees draw their bipartitions from the gene trees. That constraint is enough to make this problem polynomial time and statistically consistent. So, Astral is statistically consistent, it is polynomial time, and it has become the most commonly used summary method for species tree estimation. It's used all over now. So let me just point out that there are these two competing approaches. One is concatenation, one is astral and other summary methods, okay? An example of concatenation is maximum likelihood, here, I'm showing Raxamel as the approach because Raxamel is the dominant maximum likelihood method. The other is for each gene, get a gene tree and then combine them using the astral software or some other such summary method. The choice between these two approaches has been debated. There are people who really hate concatenation because of the statistical consistency problem. There are people who really hate summary methods because they believe that the accuracy is better with concatenation. So it's a very interesting debate. And it's interesting because it turns out to not be so clear cut. Here is an example of a simulation study where we looked at simulating sequences down gene trees, estimating gene trees and combining them. We are, these are, I think, um, they're not very big. I think if I remember, that's about 40 species, but we are looking, I think, at a thousand genes and the species tree error is on the y-axis. So it's the fraction of the bipartitions in the species tree that you fail to recover. Um, what I'm showing here are five different methods, Astral, Astrid, and MPS. These are summary methods. CAML is concatenation using maximum likelihood, maximum likelihood, not machine learning. CAML and it's RAXML. And in between, there's this thing called SVD quartets, which is a very interesting method that is based upon linear algebra. And it looks at the concatenation, but
but it estimates quartet trees and then combines them. Okay, so up here it says high incomplete lineage sorting. That means that on average, the gene trees differ from the species tree in 41% of their edges. I've binned these methods, uh, these data sets into three sets, depending upon how much error there is in the gene trees. Because you remember these are estimated gene trees. 20 to 50% error means that 20 to 50% on average of their edges are wrong, 50 to 80, and then 80 to 85. Uh, N tells you how many data sets are in each bin. What you see as you go from left to right, for the lowest error, the methods that are the most accurate are Astral, Astrid, and MPS. SVD Cortez has the highest error, concatenation is in between. So when you have good gene trees, you want to do summary methods. When you get to somewhat higher error, it's different. All of a sudden, concatenation is the best. When you get to much higher gene tree estimation error, now concatenation is much better. And SVD Cortex is also good. So the amount of gene tree estimation error impacts the relative accuracy of concatenation and summary methods. So it's not a simple story. When you're working with estimated gene trees, the theory about statistical consistency fails to be applicable because the theory is based upon true gene trees. You don't get true gene trees. So I hope you, you see this difference that concatenation is sometimes the best thing to do, okay? Depends upon how much gene tree estimation error you have. Now you might look at this and say, well, that's high ILS, but what about when you have extremely high ILS? And the study that I was just showing also shows what happens under low ILS and very high ILS. Even under very high ILS, where the gene trees are on average 75% different from the species tree, you still get this trend where with a very, very high gene tree estimation error, you want concatenation, you want concatenation. Even here, you would want concatenation. Here, they're all equal. This, okay, SVD Cortez is a bit worse, but so it really depends upon the gene tree estimation error. Okay, so this is my summary of, so of part one. From a theory perspective, we have this nice theorem that says for incomplete lineage sorting, the, for every four species, the most probable unrooted gene tree is the same as the true species tree. And that enables gene tree summary methods to be statistically consistent. But those assumptions assume true gene trees. You don't get the same guarantees when you have estimated gene trees. And if you have estimated gene trees, the choice of methods depends upon how accurate your gene trees are. Okay, so I'm just gonna just say before I move to the next part is that in phylogenomic data sets, you often have poor gene trees. In the Avian project, the average bootstrap support was 25%. When you are using genome scale data, you don't get beautiful gene trees because you're working with a lot of regions of the genome that are not evolving very fast. And they don't evolve fast enough, you can't get a good gene tree. So this is a real issue. Okay, part two. I'm switching now to talking about species tree estimation under gene duplication and loss. Under ILS, we know a lot. Under gene duplication and loss, we know much less. But what you have here is a situation where you have a gene duplication within the species tree. And now you have two copies of the gene, and those two copies of the gene evolve down all of the branches, and every genome has two copies. If you pull this apart, you get a tree that has, it's a gene family tree. Every species appears twice, but that gene family tree is really two copies of the species tree. So if you looked at this gene family tree, you could say, okay, I know the species tree. It's A, B versus C. Fine. Um, but this can be more complicated. And what I'm gonna be talking about is estimating species trees from gene family trees. And we're also called them multi-copy gene family trees or mull trees. So I will remind you that in the plant transcriptome project, in our first study, we went from 9,500 genes down to 400. Why? Because we got rid of every gene that was multi-copy. That's a huge loss of data. 
if you're throwing out that much data, you should be worried about that you, you're going to get a bad answer because you don't have enough information. So we'd like to be able to keep all the data and estimate the species tree directly. Now, there are three different basic ways to do species tree estimation under gene duplication and loss. One is to throw out the multi-copy genes, which is what we did with the thousand plant transcriptome project. The other one is to figure out orthology. Figuring out orthology amounts to figuring out which gene copies evolved from speciate, uh, du evolved down a species tree without duplication, okay? So which gene copies within uh, the different species are orthologs. That's actually a very, very hard problem. There's a lot of progress, but it's still not adequately solved. And some of the best methods are computationally intensive. The third option is to try to estimate the species tree by combining the gene family trees. Work in this area has included methods for gene tree parsimony, where you try to find the species tree that has the smallest number of duplications and losses. Gene tree parsimony is a very nice approach. It's a very natural, intuitive approach, but we still don't know if there's any statistical consistency guarantee. And in fact, until 2019, nothing had been proven to be statistically consistent for estimating the species tree under GDL. But in 2019, we were able to make some progress. Now, let me show you why this is not trivial. So, as I said, if you have only one duplication and you have no losses, it's pretty easy to get the species tree. You have a duplication here. You're going to get a copy of ABC, a copy of ABC, and D is on the outside. That's easy. This is a duplication, but two losses. So you lose B1 and you lose C1. And you have a gene family tree that has two copies of A, a copy of C, and a copy of B, and then one copy of D. You probably can't figure out the species tree from that. But what about, but at least you know it's a gene family tree because you see two copies of A. But this one is even harder. You lose B1, you lose A2, and you lose C2. Now you have A1, C1, and B2, and D. It's a single copy gene tree. You might think that this is the species tree, but it's not. So if you have enough loss, you can mess it up. So given the set of gene family trees, can we estimate the species tree? The first proof of anything being statistically consistent came in 2019, where the basic theorem was under gene duplication and loss, under some natural models of gene duplication and loss within species trees, the most probable quartet tree is the species tree. And what that led to is a proof that a variant of astral that was designed to deal with multiple individuals per species is statistically consistent under gene duplication and loss. It also follows that it runs in polynomial time. So we have a proof that astral multi is statistically consistent. That was the breakthrough in 2019. The strange thing is that when you look at it on simulated data, you don't get necessarily a great feeling about its accuracy. So this is a simulation with 100 species, and we're looking at different numbers of genes from 25 up to 500. We're looking at four different methods, astral, multi, dupe tree, which is gene tree parsimony, and then these two methods, which are both heuristics for um, the maximum, uh, the Robinson fold super tree problem extended to deal with multries. What they do is not as important as just the trends. Let's look at the species tree error. The, this is again, astral multi. It's not as good as these two heuristics for the Robinson fold super tree. Here's at 50 genes, astral multi is over here. Here are the two heuristics for Robinson fold super trees. At 100 genes, here's astral multi and the Robinson fold super trees are better. And again, at 500. So what you're seeing is that for whatever reason, even though astral multi is statistically consistent, it is not as accurate as some other methods. Now, it's also not the fastest method, right? Here's 
here's astral multi. It's not as fast as one of the two uh, Robinson fold super tree heuristics. So it's not as accurate and it's not as fast. It tells you that statistical consistency guarantees don't give you relative performance advantages. So this observation that astral multi was statistically consistent but wasn't performing very well led Siavish Mirarab, who is the main developer for astral, to modify astral to specifically address gene duplication and loss. Now, his specific modification is called Astral Pro. Um, the idea is you take each gene family tree and you root it, and then you identify, after rooting it, you identify the duplication nodes. What, that's straightforward after it's rooted. And once you've identified the duplication nodes, you can interpret which things are orthologs, and you only have to work with quartets that involve orthologs. That's the idea. That enables Astral to still run in polynomial time and to have nice accuracy. Now the rooting is done to minimize the total number of duplications and losses. That rooting is polynomial time and the tagging follows directly from the rooting. And there's a nice theorem that says, if step one is correct, if he never makes a mistake, then it's statistically consistent. So that's a nice theorem. But I just want you to remember it says, it's assuming that it does first step correctly. And you have to realize that's essentially the same thing as figuring out orthology. Okay, this is an example from their study on different models of evolution that are varying gene duplication and loss, as well as incomplete linear sorting and different sequence lengths per gene. So you have higher gene tree estimation here than here. And what the basic comparison I want you to see is just between these two, astral multi and purple, astral pro in blue, Purple is always worse than blue. Astral Pro is improving on Astral Multi. And in fact, Astral Pro is tying for best. It's either strictly best or tying for best in all of these analyses. Okay, so, so Astral Pro is a breakthrough and it is now very much in use. It's not the only method that I want you to know about. So if any of you are working with species tree estimation dealing with gene duplication and loss, here's another technique. So what it does is it takes the gene family trees, and these are, of course, multi-copy gene trees, and then it splits each gene family tree into a bunch of single copy gene trees. The way that it does that, in fact, is it is using Astral Pro to root and tag each gene family tree, and then it goes from the bottom up and it just pulls out single copy trees as it's going up, trying to keep a very large tree at the end. And this is an example. Here's your gene family tree, lots of copies. It goes up and identifies in green, the duplication nodes. And then it goes up and it cuts edges that, that are between underneath a duplication node. You have to cut at least one of them because otherwise you, have, you don't have single copy trees. And you just keep going up and cutting so as to keep a large subtree. And so this tree would be, uh, you'd cut two different edges and you get three subtrees. Each of these subtrees is single copy. Once you've done that, you can follow with any method that requires single copy genes, including astral, astrid. These are two different summary methods or concatenation analysis. You can take the genes that are now single copy and you can take the alignments and you can concatenate them. So here is a simulation study. Um, and what you can see, again, tree error on the y-axis. Here's runtime, here's memory. Let's stick with the tree error. Astral Pro, Astrid Disco, which is taking the single copy trees from Disco and feeding them into a summary method called Astrid. Species Rex, which was a method developed by Alexis Damatakis to deal with gene duplication and loss, and concatenation disco. So you're taking the alignments and concatenating them. And we're varying the number of gene trees or gene family trees from 10 up to 1,000. And these data sets all have 100 species and gene duplication and loss, as well as incomplete lineage sorting. So the trends the first thing is pink. Concatenation disco, 
It's best at 10 genes. It's tied for best at 50. It's best at 100. And it's not running at 1,000. <laughs> so it has a limit. It has a computational issue. But when it can run, it has high accuracy. What about the other methods? They're all very close, OK? It's really hard to say which one is best. But this is 101 species. What about runtime? The fastest method is Astrid Disco. This is a logarithmic scale. The fastest method is Astrid Disco. Um, concatenation Disco is the slowest. And then the others are in between. Memory usage, it's fine. These are relatively low. This is gigabytes. So it's there's a runtime advantage to Astro Disco, and Astro Disco is tying with Astral Pro. OK, but when you get to 1,000 species and 1,000 genes, you can't do concatenation disco. So you only have these other methods. And here you can see, again, Astro Disco is doing very well accuracy-wise. It's as good or it's actually a little bit better than Astral Pro. Species Rax is still worse. But look at this runtime advantage. Now, this is not logarithmic, but there's a runtime advantage and there's a memory advantage. So if you have gene duplication and loss, you can use DISCO as well as Astral Pro. And DISCO allows you to choose how you work with your single copy trees. OK, so the summary for estimating species trees when you have gene duplication and loss, you do not need to throw out any of your data. You do not need to determine orthology. This is a plus. Uh, summary methods can provide high accuracy and can be very fast. Concatenation analysis on single copy genes uh, that you obtain using DISCO is actually potentially really accurate, but there's a runtime issue. But none of these good performing methods have any guarantee of statistical consistency under DDL. So that's another important limitation. So, in the, I'm going to quickly cover um, maximum likelihood gene tree estimation. So what I've been talking about so far is species tree estimation. But gene tree estimation is another problem where you're working on a single gene evolving down a tree. We want to construct maximum likelihood trees, which are unrooted trees. We're doing this under standard models like GTR. There's a beautiful theory. It's NP hard, we need good heuristics, but the good heuristics have excellent performance and RaxML in particular has dominated the field. There's other methods like IQ tree, which are also very good, but RaxML is still the dominant method. So we wanna do better than RaxML. So we came up with a technique which allows us to take a very large data set, imagine 10,000 sequences, and you take that data set and you divide the data set into subsets, disjoint subsets. You then get RaxML trees on the subsets. And then you're gonna combine these disjoint trees into a tree on the full data set by using some auxiliary information. Now this kind of divide and conquer strategy is actually more general, but I'm treating it just for the case of maximum likelihood. And the important thing to realize is that these trees that you get on the subsets, you're not allowed to change them. You can only merge them somehow, either allowing them to blend or not to blend. The guide tree merger is a, the technique that for whatever reason works the best. Here is a result on tree error on simulated data from 1,000 sequences up to 50,000 sequences comparing fast tree, which is very fast, maximum likelihood heuristic, IQ tree, RaxML, and our divide and conquer pipeline. So the, the things to notice is that with a thousand sequences, but a lot of fragmentary sequences, that's what HF stands for. Uh, fast tree is bad, RaxML is the best. RNA sim, which is a simulation with, um, uh, with selection on it to maintain the RNA structure, all the methods are equally good. The COX-1 heterotachy simulation, heterotachy is a very complicated process. Fast tree is bad again. The other methods are comparable. RNA sim with 10,000 sequences, suddenly RaxML is the worst. And the divide and conquer is the best. RaxML 50K, 50,000 sequences, 
Rapsimil, when it ran, had 100% error. IQ tree failed to run. And the only methods that ran were fast tree and this divide and conquer strategy. So we have a technique now that's in scale to very large data sets. And this is for me very exciting and um, focusing on these large ones, especially, okay, where we have a real advantage. So I'm going to skip and just go to this summary. These divide and conquer pipelines have nice theoretical guarantees. You can use them with species tree estimation as well. They maintain statistical consistency. They can run in polynomial time. They're highly parallelizable. And the, the technique we're particularly using uses an initial tree to do the decomposition and the combination step. And the whole thing is very, very fast. Okay, so my summary for this talk is large scale phylogeny estimation is really becoming feasible if you want to use genome scale data, species tree estimation, addressing ILS alone, astral is the dominant method. It's not the only method, but right now it's the dominant method. Astral Pro is one of is probably the dominant method for species tree estimation under GDL and ILS, but Astro Disco and concatenation analysis with Disco are, are actually quite feasible alternatives and faster. Um, at least Astro Disco is faster. And we can do maximum likelihood gene tree estimation on ultra large data sets now. And what I haven't shown is that some of these methods are also useful for multiple sequence alignment, but that would have been another talk. So the people who did a lot of this work, Siavish Mirab, my former student, who's the leader for Astral, Erin Malloy, who did um, a bunch of this work, including the first divide and conquer strategies, um, Paul Saharius, who was a postdoc, who did a lot of the simulations, and the maximum likelihood idea, and Minyuk who's Park, who's a current PhD student who did a bunch of this work as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot, Sandy. It was a very nice talk, and I and we have to thank you because you, you explained it very well, and I think in simple terms. Uh, so I, I understand that many people that is not maybe into the phylogeny topic uh, were able to, to follow everything. So thank you for that. So we have time for questions. Um, so whoever wants to ask, uh, you can you can raise your hand, but uh, you can simply open up your mic and, and ask questions to Tandy. Should I stop sharing? Yeah, maybe that's that's good unless yeah, yeah, that's okay. So any questions? Well, people is deciding maybe I'm asking you one. Um, many of the methods you, you were explaining, they need uh, rooted gene trees. No, none no? of them. None okay. of them. None so of them. Astro, none of them. Astro takes unrooted trees. Astro takes unrooted okay. trees. The only method that I showed that takes rooted gene trees is MPS. Oh, okay. And MPS is no longer in use. Um, Miguel uh, has the question. Yeah, OK. Miguel. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So as Tony may have realized I'm not Mickey, but okay. we are all here <laughs> asking okay. questions. Uh, I wanted to ask you since the, the presentation was really great. Thank you. you. Could comment maybe more for the younger students, the do's and don'ts of like concatenation because across the years I've seen all sorts of uh, black magic and there's a few <laughs> things what would you consider the highest source of bias in a concatenation approach? Okay, that's a really interesting question. Um, so, I mean, I think you see for these simulations, there's no clear preference for one method over another, even when you have extremely high levels of ILS. So what is the bias problem? If your gene trees are biased, okay? If your gene estimated gene trees are wrong, um, and they're biased, for example, because of the Felsenstein zone, which is long branch attraction, you can have a problem no matter what you do, whether you do a summary method or concatenation. So that issue of gene tree estimation error, if it's really random error, it's not that big a deal. Um, you can do concatenation. If you have bias towards a particular topology, nothing works. Okay, so I think that it's very important to look at your data and see if your, if your genes um, are biased. It, you can also have bias in your gene trees because of selection. If you're using, for example, introns, you get a different situation than you when you're using exons. Exons are under selection in a way that introns aren't quite. 
And so you can have differences. I mean, it's really important to look at your data. Uh, the, of course, then the other thing is just even single gene tree estimation, you have to think about the models, whether or not your estimation is appropriate. I mean, basically, phylogeny estimation is challenging. And then you also need to look at your multiple sequence alignments. So I mean, everything is challenging, okay? So I would say that there's no simple answer. Just be uh, careful and really look at your data carefully. Good. Thank Questions? you. Yeah, I have another one. Yes. Yeah. There was published last year that uh, th there was a problem when, when inferring with multi-core uh, programs like IQ3, they found like some, some errors between trees done with a single core and multi-core. Uh, have you noticed that? Or... No, but that's very interesting. I mean, you're talking essentially about the implementation side, right? Yeah. Oh, very interesting. I didn't know that. Um, I would love it if you'd email me and, and send, yeah. me that, send me the paper. Um, look, when it, always the thing to realize is that when you're working with, a, with an NP hard optimization problem, you're not guaranteed to solve it. It's really important to remember that. Um, in fact, you know, what I, could, what I could show you, in fact, I might as well show you since... Uh, uh, so might as well show you this, the thing that I didn't show. Um, we're able to solve maximum likelihood better. The scores are actually better. Mm -hmm. So if we run RaxML without a starting tree and we're running it for days, this is on a data set with 70,000 sequences, we are finding better scores, okay? So this is, you know, this is after a week of analysis and we're doing a better job. So even RaxML, okay? And, even RaxML isn't solving its optimization problem perfectly. So yeah. talking about multi-core versus single core, it's affecting, obviously it's affecting the search. So be aware of that. Okay, thank you. More questions? So I have, a, I have another one. Um, so of course, in gene concatenation, the branch length is obvious how we compute the branch lengths, you know, from, from uh, we can have partitions with different models and, and then estimate branch lengths within the maximum likelihood. So maybe you can say some words on how this can be done in a, in a gene tree based approach. Okay, so it's an interesting question. So if you're trying to get, if you're trying to get, I know I, I personally don't work on branch length estimation because I think it's very tricky. Um, it's just like getting dates. I think these are all very tricky, but branch links. If you, if you think about gene tree heterogeneity and you think about how the gene trees can be topologically different and they can have different branch links, even the estimation of branch length is a question. Like what do the branch links mean? If you want them to be coalescent unit branch lengths, okay, as opposed to something else, they're not substitution units, they're coalescent units, right? Because it's a species tree, okay? then Astral has a way of doing that. Okay. Astral provides branch length estimates. Those I think are reasonably good. Um, but again, it's making assumptions that your gene trees are either correct or that, that the error in the gene trees is random and not biased. So otherwise you can have problems with the branch length estimation. Okay? So that's my basic answer about that. But even on a single tree, a CRC, even on a single gene, Branch length estimation, I, I think that's a, there's a practical challenge there as well as theoretical, right? Mm -hmm. Theoretically, you're just doing hill climbing to get branch lengths. I don't even know if it theoretically converges to the, to the correct answer, right? There's that result that Mike Steele did years ago about the maximum likelihood tree is not unique. He was talking about branch length estimation. Mm -hmm. um, so practically speaking, it's really hard to do this on a large tree with very many sites. So I think on a practical level, how do you estimate it perhaps using a fraction of the sites? That's another question, right? Yeah. So it's a long question, a long answer uh, to a, a short answer to a very interesting <coughs> question and a longer answer would be needed. Yeah. And I don't even know the answer. It's just I have more questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, more questions from the audience? I'm going to put my email address into the chat. If anyone wants to follow up with a direct email, I would be more than happy to answer. Yeah. Okay. 
So Tend is having some some meetings with some of us, uh, uh, virtually, but she she is willing to answer more questions by email or maybe having a chat with you uh, yeah. in a later day. So ah, there's some. Ah, I see your, your email. Okay, perfect. So you all have the Tandy's email. So with this, I think we thank uh, Tandy again, and yeah, thank you, and hope next time you come in person. And wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.